Good afternoon, everybody, and um, you know, welcome to uh, uh, the next installment of our series of webinars. Um, uh, I'm Ken Medlock. I'm the director of the Center for Energy Studies here. I'm really pleased to be joined um, by Jared Thomas today. Jared is a business development manager at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, um, has spent um, a good chunk of his career looking at carbon capture uh, technologies, and I'm looking forward to the conversation today with him uh, on this front. The, um, the role of carbon capture uh, has really evolved quite dramatically in, in general public policy discourse uh, in terms of what it can mean for low carbon futures. Um, just 10, 15 years ago, it really wasn't something that was on most people's uh, minds. Um, yet today, the, the, the wave of new proposed carbon capture projects that have sort of been coming forth, which almost seems daily, um, you can find these on the Global, um, uh, Global Carbon Capture Initiative the Institute. They have a, a nice sort of synopsis of all the different projects that have been proposed and when, when they make them online. But that is growing um, dramatically. And that really reflects the state of technology and, and, and the demands that are being placed on industry to, to reduce carbon footprints. And uh, given that the world is uh, very, still very heavily dependent on fossil fuels and the combustion of fossil fuels contributes a large fraction of global CO2 emissions. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to have to really think seriously about how to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's where carbon capture technologies fit in. Um, Jared, um, I want uh, welcome to wel welcome to the Baker Institute virtually. Um, uh, it's great to see you again. And uh, I wonder if you could just take a minute and introduce yourself to everybody and sort of uh, why you're here. Yeah, so I appreciate that, Ken. So first of all, thanks to the Rice University Baker Institute for hosting me today. I'm really happy to be here to talk about CCUS and, um, you know, my experience and answer anyone's questions. So I'm Jared Thomas, and I'm a business development manager at MHIA. Been with the company now for about three years, but, you know, as you mentioned, CCUS really hasn't been at the forefront of the discussion. You know, it wasn't at least 10 or 15 years ago, but for me it was. And so I've been involved in CCUS now for over 10 years. I spent five years at Southern Company running their large-scale large scale carbon capture and sequence, well, mostly just carbon capture demonstration program. Um, one of the large projects that I ran there was the plant berry demonstration in South Alabama. It actually used MHI's technology, and so that's how I really became familiar with the company uh, while I was at Southern. Hopped around a few different roles at other places, really still focused on carbon capture, and then ended up here at MHI. So, you know, and one thing that you mentioned about GCCSI's uh, list of planned projects got me thinking, you know, they also have a list of projects that have been executed prior to today. And so where we are today is around 40 million tons per year of carbon that is uh, captured and sequestered. Uh, that number, if you look at, for instance, IEA projections show that CCUS has a huge role to play uh, even by 2030. So that number is expected or, you know, projected to go to around a billion tons per year. And, and so if you just look at the projects that are, that are currently in the planning phases now, which amounts to about 60 million tons per year, and you track that out for the next seven or eight years, uh, you see that there's going to be a significant amount of deployment of carbon capture uh, that we're currently, you know, that we currently haven't seen yet. But, but it's going to happen for sure. So that's uh, that actually raises a really good point. I mean, the, the, you're, you're kind of speaking to the acceleration and the interest of getting this this technology or these technologies, I should say, deployed. I wonder if you could maybe um, talk a little bit from your own perspective, being involved in this industry, um, how the technology's evolved, um, how mature is it, what's on the horizon. I know this is opening kind of a, a massive can of worms, but that's really kind of the point. Uh, and I know you can sort of wax on about these things. So um, would love to hear you hear you address that. Yeah, so, you know, really, as you mentioned, it is somewhat of a complicated question. So I could go back, you know, 100 years to really start talking about how the technology has evolved because carbon capture itself is really modeled around what midstream facilities have been using for, you know, decades. And it, it principally consists of an absorber to separate the CO2 and a regenerator to, you know, free the CO2. And then you have your captured CO2. What you do with it from there uh, depends on, uh, on, you know, volumes and whatnot. Um, 
But for the process itself, you know, the, the basic core process looks about the same as it has for gas processing facilities for quite some time. There are some notable differences. And, you know, if you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I probably would have described CCS as more of a nascent field. And indeed, I think many people even today would still describe it that way. But, but, but personally, I, I now don't see it uh, as nascent. And so, you know, we're, we're willing to design and build a carbon capture facility now and provide guarantees based on, you know, over 30 years of experience. We had our first commercial facility in the 90s in Malaysia, and we've had, you know, 12 more commercial facilities since then, the, the final one being the Petronova facility, which is the largest in the world. And so we're comfortable enough designing, you know, removal facilities based on different flue gas compositions under different circumstances. And I think that that's one thing that, that has really evolved, you know, uh, just the comfort level there and the comfort level of others to deploy these technologies. Now, in terms of the technology itself, there have been some notable improvements. So five years ago, again, if you had asked me that question, five, ten years ago when I was a Southern company, the standard capture ratio, which is basically the amount of CO2 that you remove from the flue gas or the gas that you're treating, was around 85 or 90 percent. Today, the baseline is 95 percent. And so that's 95 percent of the CO2 removed uh, of, of the amount of CO2 that's coming in. And, and that's sort of where we have arrived as the most optimal point for most cases on a dollars per ton basis. Okay, so um, speaking to that point, the, um, the evolution of the technology. Um, I know MHI has been involved very heavily. I think you're the largest provider of um, uh, carbon capture uh, equipment globally. Um, how is that moving forward? I mean, there's a lot of concern about the technology itself and its ability to actually deliver what it promises. Um, you hear various concerns raised by um, different groups um, that really focus in on cost as well as efficiency. Um, I wonder if you could maybe address some of those, because not just from the standpoint of how the technology is evolving in terms of our ability to capture and, and to capture it more efficiently, but what's happening on the cost front? And, and how do you see that sort of playing out as we move forward? Yeah, you know, you mentioned a couple of things there. Cost is one, and and cost, indeed, you know, again, go back to conversations that, that, I, that I, you know, explicitly recall sitting around tables with, you know, 20 others debating, really, what the cost of a carbon capture facility would be. And, you know, at the time we were around, and this is specifically for coal-fired flue gas, you know, the, the thoughts were and projections from DOE and other um, expert bodies were that it would be three to three to $4,000 per kilowatt, you know, equivalent of electricity to install carbon capture. And, you know, I made the comment based on our experience at Plant Berry that, you know, costs were probably a lot closer to $2,000 per kW, and today they're, they're significantly lower. Um, from the Petronova facility, we have publicly stated that we can achieve approximately a 30% cost reduction, you know, like for like. So assuming that the facility is largely similar, and doesn't have to be the same, but similar, we can achieve approximately a 30% cost reduction. That's, you know, through reduction in margins, redundancy, optimization, um, and so we're just becoming better at designing and building these facilities. Now, uh, you know, I mentioned 30 percent. That's a pretty big number. That's just for the EMP of the carbon capture ISDL. You know, it wouldn't necessarily include transportation or some integration aspects at the facility, you know, that have to be done that really depend on the host site. Now, you know, you might wonder, would we be able to see this same kind of cost reduction today? And my response to that would be that for the first few commercial projects, let's just say that we have three or four over the next uh, few years, uh, we will see some cost reduction. But, uh, you know, the, the really large reductions, uh, I, I think, are still there. But I think that they're probably a little bit longer out. Uh, so, you know, as we build three or four and then we start, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, now we're talking about uh, realizing some optimization in fabrication of equipment, for instance. And so can you, can you see a 10 to 15 percent 
uh, equipment cost reduction just because you're fabricating the same thing over and over. And I, I think that there's a, a strong possibility to realize that. Again, uh, probably won't see it early on, but it will materialize. And then the other item that you mentioned, apart from cost, is on the availability or, you know, the um, operational comfort of these units. Uh, well, for, for you know, Petronova specifically, which is down for economic reasons, the technical aspect, I think we satisfied the over 90% goal that we had for that facility. If you just look at the uh, CCS island itself, and, you know, based on what I've seen, I would think we'd be comfortable with even higher numbers than that for future facilities. Now, I know some of the literature that you've referenced, and I've, I've reached out to some of the folks that have been involved there, and, and they've defined any kind of conversation. So it's not, you know, everything that you see out there may not accurately paint the picture. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fair. Uh, and admittedly, we're talking about a technology a lot of people don't really have a lot, of, a tremendous amount of depth with um, and understanding. And I think it's interesting you referenced um, effectively economies of scale, um, you know, cost reductions and fabrication, um, that kind of stuff. So, um as we as we go forward, we do see those scale economies begin to emerge. I guess walk me through briefly where the most cost effective places to deploy the technologies are today, and and how that might sort of change as we go forward. Because, you know, it it it, it obviously it varies by the by the CO two stream, right? So, um, uh, in terms of where the the low hanging fruit is versus where those cost reductions will really come to bear and bring bring additional opportunities into the into the fore, that'd be great to hear as well. Yeah, so that that's another multifaceted question. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned one part uh, source. And so you want to go for the low-hanging low fruit first. You want to target those sources that have high CO2 concentration, like ethanol production. You know, you get CO2 uh, concentrations 20 30% in, in those types of facilities. But like for a natural gas combined cycle, you're like 3 to 5% CO2. And so it becomes, you know, more expensive per ton of CO2, the lower the concentration is. And so excluding that, you know, you really look at location. And so, uh, you know, you're going to be capturing a thousand tons per day plus of CO2. You really need somewhere to put it. And if you're not located to existing infrastructure, well, then planning that infrastructure has to be part of your project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that there's, it's, it's expensive, right? And, uh, and so you, you would much rather be near a injection site or near a pipeline that you can put your CO2. There are some pipelines that are already uh, in existence today that have excess capacity. They're just, they're just waiting for capture facilities to come online and, and start sending them their CO2. The, the Alberta carbon trunk line in Canada is one of those. And so, you know, they're, um, it was intentionally designed to have a larger capacity so that they could start pulling from different uh, emitters around the um, Alberta area. And so you'll, you'll see that uh, come to bear. And uh, then you'll see, you know, the infrastructure bill that recently passed uh, here in the U.S. You're going to see that facilitate the deployment of large pipelines for uh, moving CO2 around and getting it to where it needs to be. And, and then, you know, for MHI specifically, we're actually looking at, you know, because Japan uh, itself does, doesn't really have the geology to sequester CO2, we're looking at transporting CO2 and creating an entire CO2 ecosystem uh, upon which companies can really depend so that they can use carbon capture. That's interesting, actually, because you I mean, you, you're, you're referencing something that is kind of at the core of, of you know, work that we're doing here at the Center for Energy Studies, which is really around um, <clears throat> creating the entire supply chain. Right. And when you talk about carbon capture, it's one thing to just have a general discussion about, you know, getting the um, getting the equipment in place. But then how do you incentivize a company to install the equipment if there's nowhere for the CO2 to go? And so you need the pipeline in place, then you need the offtake at the other end of the system. So <clears throat> there really is a full value chain perspective here. Um, all that said, the most capital intensive part of it is the quote unquote upstream part of it. It's the capture part of the equation. So um, I think seeing the, the development or the, the, the shift in um, cost structure 
would be a welcome development. You referenced the, you know, infrastructure um, infrastructure policy in the United States as well as in Canada, and kind of what what's driving um, uh, adoption in, in different places around the world. I guess from from MHI's perspective and the various initiatives that y'all are involved in, I wonder if you could talk for a minute about where you're seeing um, the most aggressive um, sort of uptake of carbon capture technology and where the biggest opportunities lie from your own perspective um, with regard to deploying this technology in different places around the world. Yeah, you know, that's a different answer uh, if asked at a different time. So, you know, I've been involved in this now for a bit over a decade, and if you'd asked me 10 years ago, well, that's when we were we were looking at uh, a clean power plan potentially, and the the goals are really targeting the, the largest emitters, and so that's the power sector, and 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 so that's where the interest, most of the interest, came from. In fact, when we started. Uh, developing our technology for coal-based applications uh, in the late 90s. We started at one ton per day and, and went up to 10 tons per day and then 500 tons per day at the plant dairy facility that, that I manage well as a southern company. Uh, we were really just geared toward power generation. But now, now it's, it's well beyond power generators. Now we've got different industrial emitters that are approaching us. You know, it's, it's not just, it's also not just coal-based uh, power generation. It's, you know, there are a lot of combined cycles and, you know, indeed thousands of gas turbines around the world that uh, if they're not go going to be burning hydrogen, they'll most likely need to be capturing that CO2. And, and yes, we can do it, as I mentioned, at the 95% um, capture ratio and, 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 you know, allow those units to be very low carbon power generators. I mentioned industrial, you know, cement producers, steel producers, uh, mining companies, for instance, refineries. And there's just a whole host of uh, companies out there that are interested in this now. And, and it's difficult to pinpoint anyone as, you know, showing the most interest. I think simply because power generation has been looking at this for, for quite some time, we still see a lot, we continue to see strong interest there. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's spread uh, throughout the different types. And so biomass, for instance, you know, we've got, uh, we recently um, have an agreement in place with Drax in the UK, Drax Power Station. It uh, uses uh, woody biomass to generate power. And so we're going to be using our technology at that facility to create the world's first net negative biomass plant. So that's a, a project that we're very proud of and we're currently in the midst of um, you know, and, and then, uh, again, I, you know, as I mentioned, power generator, but not gas, not coal. So it's, it's just becoming more varied every day. Can you, that, that's a really interesting one, the net negative from a, from a biomass perspective, because there's a lot of interest in general in biomass as a fuel source, a clean fuel source. And, <clears throat> you know, that's very different than the, the standard kind of discussions around biomass as being relatively dirty for you in terms of its use for heat um, in, in low income regions. Right. But um, thinking about it as a clean energy source that's paired with carbon capture and becomes net negative. Could you actually uh, expand on that a little bit? What do you mean when you say net negative? I guess that's the first part of the question. And yeah, sure. So, yeah. So of course, there, it, you know, it, it, it primarily depends on or the key differentiator between I'll say normal power production, gas or coal, uh, or any other, is that they're just burning a different fuel type. And so the sweet biomass that I mentioned, uh, of course, you know, they, they harvest that material. And, in, and in, that, in the place of where they harvest, trees grow again, right? And so you're going to have that cycle continue. Uh, today, without carbon capture, those processes uh, would not be net negative. But because you're taking the CO2 that's generated then from burning that biomass and sequestering it or utilizing it, uh, then now that's an additional sink uh, for that CO2. So you've got, you know, the sink from the atmosphere uh, from harvesting fuel and having more uh, material grow in its place. And then you've got the sink from capturing the CO2 where you're generating the power. Gotcha. Yeah, now that's that's really interesting. That's um. <clears throat> 
Um, I think that's got a, a, a very strong role to play. I know there's a lot of interest in, in, in this sort of offset discussion, right, which is really focused on nature-based solutions. This just adds an element to that, I think. So that's, that's very interesting. Um, I, I, real quick, I just want to let everybody know, if you have a question um, that you'd like us to address in this conversation, please um, enter it through the Q&A function, and I will try to weave it into our discussion uh, best as possible. Um, so, uh, Jared, in terms of regional differentiation, um, kind of where, you know, MHI is a global company, right? So you guys are everywhere. Um, but where do you see um, the greatest uptake of the technology? So in, in terms of region, not counterparties, and you know, just, just around the world, kind of walk us through, you know, I know there's some active projects in the North Sea, um, you know, that, that, that are really focused specifically on oil and gas production up there. Uh, that Equinor has been running, but there's other things that are emerging too. Um, and I wonder if you could maybe walk us through those because yes, historically, and you referenced this a minute ago, you know, a lot of the interest has been by power generators, but that's changing um, quite dramatically, particularly as we, I guess one of the buzz phrases is hard to abate sectors, right? And that's where you get into heavy in industrial applications um, where yeah. you can't necessarily electrify, um, you know, to, to get the type of heat you need. So steel is an example of this, but um, right. uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the interest that you're seeing on the, on the ground in different regions and in different industries. Sure. Yeah. And so you mentioned the North Sea. Uh, just just a, um, a side note on really, really speaking on the safety of what we do with this CO2, and that would be to sequester it. So Schleitner is a facility that has been injecting CO2 now um, for maybe 20 years. And they've injected over 20 million tons, metric tons, uh, you know, a thousand kilometers below the North Sea, and that, and you know, that's it, it's been done in a very safe way. Uh, you know, when the CO2 goes underground, it's, it's it's going to stay there for thousands of years. It, depending on where you uh, where you are in the geology, you know, it may even mineralize and form a solid. And so there's really the risk is really limited um, that there you know could be any potential safety issue there. And so they, they, that project is, has been very successful. I'm glad you mentioned the North Sea. For us specifically, we, we see it, you know, globally. Uh, if, you know, we looked at this five years ago, we would have said, I would have said, the you know, projects are really starting to, to really develop in the United States. And I think that the United States might have uh, the first EPC or the most EPCs within the next short time frame. Um, but that has evolved uh, over the last two years, really, primarily driven by regulation. And so, yes, in the U.S., we now have 45Q. There's some potential that 45Q will be uh, improved or expanded uh, soon, potentially. Uh, but in another region, let's just consider Canada, for instance, they, they now have their own investment tax credit, but they also have a carbon tax. And so by 2030, that carbon tax will, will be up to $170 per ton. And, in you know, the way that it applies is, is sort of they have a certain emissions, emissions intensity threshold that if you're over that for your particular sector, then you get this carbon tax for the amount that you're over. And so there's a lot of uh, sectors there that, that may potentially be over that threshold. And, and so th th there are a few things that they can do. Uh, to compound that, this threshold will be reduced over time. And so you may be good now, but 10 years ago, or 10 years from now, you might not be. Uh, in addition, Canada has uh, clean fuel standards that are upcoming, uh, similar to California, except Canada's are, are uh, a little more robust because they don't just cover transportation fuels. They cover uh, solid gas and liquid fuels for transportation and really any combustion. And so if you're, you're impacted by that, if you're a primary fuel producer. And so now, as I mentioned, over the past two years, what we've seen is that uh, it seems like projects there are gaining speed and they're accelerating, whereas, you know, projects in the U.S. are still moving forward. And there's a, a lot of potential that the project that we're looking at will be able to take advantage of 45Q as it's currently written. Uh, you know, if, if it does improve, well, uh, it, it, it may be uh, drinking water out of a fire hydrant type situation. But for industrial emitters specifically, 
yeah, it, when you say uh, hard to decarbonize, I think most people may not really understand what that means. So let's look at cement, for instance. Yeah. Cement is a hard to decarbonize industry. And, and why is that the case? You know, for power generators, you can go and, and substitute uh, fossil fuel consumption with uh, solar PV, for instance, and battery storage. So, they, you know, that's an option that they have. You know, it may not be the most cost effective, but it certainly is an option. For cement production, you know, they have a kiln that they may need to, to, to calcine material in, and uh, they have to provide heat for that process. And so there aren't a lot of good options today for them to do that. And so you just, you know, really what, what you look at having to do is uh, taking the CO2 out of that kiln and, and capturing it. So you, you use carbon capture on those processes. Same in uh, specific types of steel plants. So it's just a matter of, um, you know, needing the heat for some of the processes that you're carrying out. And in, and in some other cases, it may be a chemical process that is generating your CO2, for instance. And so in that case, it's not necessarily heat related, um, but there's not much that you can do to substitute out that production of CO2 because it's just uh, inherent in your process. Yeah, no, those, thanks for that. Um, it's always good to kind of ground it. There's a bunch of questions coming through and I'll try to kind of weave a, um, a pull a thread through them all that they're really kind of focused on, on the value chain. And I know that um, you guys have the, the breeze concept, right? Which is, um, and it's got three core areas. And I think if you just kind of discuss that for a few minutes, it might actually answer about half the questions that have come through so far, because you know, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand how do you overcome the cost hurdles associated with capture, transport, and sequestration, given that it's just a cost sink and the tax credit's necessary? You know, that sort of helps push some projects over the over the commercial viability edge, um, but not all. Um, and then there's the issue of what do you what if you can find a value proposition associated with the CO2 itself, right? And I know you guys right. are, are involved in that space. So Big question, lots of lots of things in that one, I know, but um, maybe if you could just chat about that the Breeze concept a little bit, that, that might yeah, help. Yeah, so sure, yeah, Breeze really <clears throat> is uh, it's a three-pillar approach to addressing TCUS technical and scaling challenges. So what are those three pillars? The first of those three pillars is contain. And so contain, it, it's fairly self-explanatory, and it relates to um, our expertise around carbon capture and the fact that we have 13 commercial facilities already today that utilize the KMCDR process, which is our post-combustion carbon capture process that we offer. And, and so I mentioned the DRAX project earlier. You know, that is uh, uh, really an example of contain. We have, uh, you know, all of the uh, testing that we've done. We've, we've recently wrapped up testing at the Technology Center Monstead for a new solvent that is now commercial, KS21. That, that's another aspect of contain. And so there's you know, all, everything that I talk about related to carbon capture sort of fits into this contained bucket. The next is Connect. And so Connect describes MHI's portfolio of solutions covering the entire CCUS value chain uh, with the specific aim of connecting the upstream and downstream parts. And so, you know, for this entire ecosystem that I've mentioned several times now, uh, you know, it doesn't just consist of capturing the CO2. There's, there's obviously quite a bit to it. And I mentioned, you know, if you're a company that doesn't have access to a pipeline, you have to figure that out. Well, we're sort of getting involved here in uh, the connect part, which uh, relates to that to an extent. Uh, one of the, I'll say, products that fits under this connect bucket is called Connect. And what that is is it's an integrated platform, an integra integrated certification platform where MHI's proudly partnering with IBM. So certification platform of what exactly? So Connect aims to provide real-time authenticated values for tracking CCUS in cyberspace using blockchain technologies and IoT connected smart meters. So Internet of Things connected smart meters um, that have been connected in ways to fit as part of this overall design Connect system. So what we're really doing there uh, in simple terms is just um, providing a way to quantify values and provide firm evidence for CO2 reduction and disposition. So, you know, it where sounds, like an, yeah. sounds like, yeah, an exactly. yeah. sounds like an audit trail. Yeah, sounds like an audit trail. Exactly, yeah. And so, you know, we're, we're proudly partnering with IBM on that, as I mentioned, that's in development there is ongoing. 
Um, this system provides a, a, a wide range of matching opportunities for participating companies, and I think it could serve as, as an ecosystem and, and or as a platform and genesis of ecosystems through which the companies participating can build on. The third pillar there is the convert pillar. And I think that that's really, uh, that was sort of the basis of your question um, because, you know, you talked about what else can we do with the CO2 and the primary goal of convert is to utilize CO2. And so uh, most of MHI's commercial facilities actually today already utilize the CO2 for chemicals production. So, you know, either urea or methanol. Um, I think we have 11 or 12 of those facilities. And then we're also investing in companies that produce synthetic fuels from CO2, as well as synthetic chemicals, um, just by converting CO2. That's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the, obviously, um, if you can expand uh, the value proposition associated with captured carbon that that changes that changes the commercial prospect of of implementing the technology because now you're actually capturing a feedstock into another commercial process and and I think there's a right. lot of a lot of potential for that to to really help help really guide um, you know broader adoption here. There was a a question that's that's kind of going to span a bridge here, but I think it's 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 a useful question and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, it's it's really related to the hydrogen world. Um, and I know MHI is also involved in hydrogen, but um, blue hydrogen specifically, um, and I think more generally, if you want to talk about turquoise, that's fine too. But um, when you think about um, capturing carbon um, in association with generating hydrogen, for industrial applications or for chemical applications or whatever the case may be, right? Um, even if it's for transport fuel. But if you're capturing the carbon associated with, say, natural gas use in an SMR to make hydrogen, um, how how linked together, that's really the core of the question. It's kind of, I think it might be kind of an obvious and simple question, but how linked together is the commercial viability of blue hydrogen and carbon capture, right? Uh, and here, you know, we can, if you want to kind of just walk through the various dimensions of, of the cost along this value chain, if you think about the blue hydrogen value chain, what do we have to overcome in order to see that industry really grow on the carbon capture side of the equation? You know, I think we may not have to overcome as much as, uh, as much as people may believe. So, you know, you, you, there's, it's obviously not something that can be broken down in just a couple of points, but I'm going to try to do that anyway. So with hydrogen, you know, when you, you know, of course, to get to, to, get to carbon-free by 2050, uh, MHI, and I agree with them, firmly believe that hydrogen will be an integral part of the transition. You know, we're working to have gas turbines that burn 100% hydrogen within the next few years, and uh, it's been one of our core areas to focus on because, you know, Actually, um, in support of carbon capture, the solvents that we use, they also need hydrogen to produce and manufacture. And as it turns out, if we're supposed to hit that 1 billion ton per year mark by 2030, well, the solvent production is going to have to also increase. And, and so, you know, needing hydrogen for that, you know, potentially we could use CCS to, to benefit CCS. But the, um, yeah, the two real, uh, I'll say um, areas that I look at for hydrogen and, and I guess hurdles. Um, one is, it, you know, comparing it to CCS itself. So yes, hydrogen production, blue hydrogen production in particular, needs to have CCS. And so you might, you might ask the question, you know, if you're building a hydrogen facility to offset natural gas use, uh, and you need CCS anyway. Why not just put CCS on the right. gas consumer? And in most cases, you'd be right. And so, not, I'll, well, I'll stop myself there. Not necessarily in most cases. In the large uh, CO2 em emitter cases, that's the case. And so, you know, if you've got one gas facility, a combined cycle that's emitting, you know, 5,000 plus tons per day, um, it probably is not going to make sense for you to build a blue hydrogen plant next to it. Uh, just go ahead and put a carbon capture facility on it. However, there are, as I mentioned earlier, thousands of gas turbines, you know, throughout the world, uh, many of those are not in that 500 plus megawatt range, right? They're a lot smaller than that. 
and you can't connect the uh, flue gas exhaust from each of those, you know, to each other to a central facility, a uh, central carbon capture facility. And so what you may end up having to do, and this doesn't just apply to power generation at an NGCC, it also applies to industrial facilities. What you may have to do is build one central hydrogen production unit, blue hydrogen, add CCS there, and distribute the hydrogen to those different facilities. And so, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, concerns or challenges earlier. I think that there's probably a case to be made for that today even. And so how does the CCS part impact that? Yes, continuing to reduce the cost in CCS will facilitate doing that short of any requirement from the government or from any stakeholder. Um, but then again, note that reducing the cost of CCS is also going to facilitate using CCS directly. Um, but where you've just got these, you know, smaller facilities, these smaller emitters, uh, they're distributed throughout, uh, you know, maybe even a fairly dense area, it, it, it's difficult to do CCS at each of those. And so maybe one hydrogen facility supplying all of them would make sense even today. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. I mean, you're basically talking about figuring out ways to capture economies of scale in the carbon capture process. Because, you know, if it is distributed around a bunch of small, relatively small emitters, it can get on a per unit basis quite expensive and quite capital intensive, that's for sure. So um, mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Um, it also seems to me that, you know, a an obvious place for deployment is is in the Texas Gulf Coast region, where there's already a lot of what we, I guess, call gray hydrogen production today, right? Just thinking about carbon capture in, in, in association with those and converting them to blue in an existing hydrogen platform. So um, I, I, can you comment on what, where you see that actually going? Is there is there very active interest in, in that space around existing hydrogen production platforms? Yeah, there is interest, certainly. And, you know, we actually have constructed CCS facilities on – uh, syngas units globally. And so I mentioned that we do have chemical, well, we do have plants that are using CO2 for chemical production. Many of those are natural gas reformer exhaust, you know, where that is um, producing some sort of a syngas and, and then that uh, is being used to create a chemical downstream. So we're doing it today. And yeah, the gray hydrogen facility can fairly simply integrate CCS, uh, you know, on that furnace part of the process and, and capture the CO2 that's generated there, you know, you just have to ask the basic questions. Is there available room? And so, you know, if you're at a refinery, you may have some footprint constraints, um, may not be necessarily easy to fit these units in. But by and large, uh, there shouldn't be any big surprises trying to add CCS to one of those units. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. It's going to be one to watch over the next uh, five to ten years for sure. Um, sure. So there's actually a, a question from one of your colleagues uh, at MHI, um, and I think it's actually it, it's a pretty good question. We've we've kind of danced around it a little bit uh, so far, but specifically, um, it's it's where do you see the CCUS CCUS in in the product life cycle? So in other words. Um, as we start to see uh, increased interest in deployment, right? Obviously, there's some carbon capture that's going on in different places uh, at different scales. But in terms of achieving a point where it is truly um, uh, a commercially viable option in lots of different applications, you know, how long a runway do you see in front of us for that? Um, today, basically. So, so, you know, what I mentioned earlier, and I'll just go back and revisit the point, is that MHI is willing to provide uh, firm guarantees, right, commercial guarantees on a facility that we design or that we have um, some uh, involvement in the design. You know, the many of the facilities that we've done globally, you know, I mentioned the 11 or so commercial facilities uh, that produce chemicals, um, you know, our role wouldn't have necessarily been like a full EPC job like it was for Petronova. But we still had some involvement in the detailed design um, or at least consulting from a, from a, from a certain aspect. And so at today, you know, we've seen so many different flue gas types. We've seen so many different components. You know, the lessons that we learned from DRAC don't just apply to biomass facilities, right? They apply to everything. And so if you have a flue gas that has any component that matches from DRAC, then, you know, we can pull lessons from DRAC and apply them to your facilities. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, high O2 facilities like uh, natural gas combined cycle that has a little bit more oxygen in the flue gas than uh, a coal facility would. You know, we, we can apply that, that sort of high oxygen and potential oxidative degradation to other designs that we have for other different types of flue gas. So that's just to say that, uh, you know, even though we, you know, our commercial facilities uh, may, only, may only have been constructed on, let's say, three or four different types of uh, emitter, well, it doesn't mean that we are constrained to just those three or four different types. In fact, we've, we've done uh, testing, solvent testing, and, and have these pilot test units on maybe eight different applications now, you know, uh, including oil-fired uh, gas and, and combined cycle exhaust and, um, of course, uh, gas furnace and coal, uh, cement and steel. So uh, I think the experience that we have now is, is varied and significant enough, again, over the last 30 years, more than 30 years, that we can take that experience and we have a commercial product today. We wrapped up, I'll mention this earlier, commercial testing of our KS21 solvent at the end of last year at the right. Technology Center Monstead. And so, you know, you might think, well, if that was just one test, well, it wasn't just one test. We had already been testing for thousands of hours prior to that at our own pilot facility, the Nanco pilot facility in Japan, uh, with KS21, and we, we didn't just test at 95%. We tested 95, you know, more than 98, 99%, uh, you know, across a, a wide range. And so, and, 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 you know, I remember this too when I was a southern company running the plant dairy demonstration. They run those facilities hard, you know, and they try to really mimic what you might see in, an, in, an, uh, in a real commercial plant. Not just mimic, but, but exceed. Right? And so they want to try to head those issues off uh, way ahead of time and design for them. And so, you know, that's why MHI's redundancy is a certain way. That's why our margins have been specified a certain way, because we really have the expertise to get there. And we'll give you a commercial facility with guarantees today. Well, that's, yeah, thanks for that. Um, another, another question came in, and, and this might be a short answer, but y you commented on you know, MHI's engagement in, um, in, in some of the uh, sort of offtake of CO2, thinking about where it's, where it's used in cements or, or, or various advanced chemistry, stuff like that. But um, a question had come through, do you all have any experience um, with, uh, with moving, um, moving captured CO2 back to well sites for enhanced recovery and if you have any anything you can say about what that what that looks like in shale, right? So, um, yeah, that's the question that came through. I just figured I'd throw it out there and see if you have any comment on that one. Yeah, so you know, moving the CO two, you're typically moving CO two via pipeline. Yeah, you can also liquefy it. Yeah, you can also liquefy it and move it via uh, rail or truck. Um, but recently, uh, MHI has been looking at also shipping CO two. And so um, MHI Group has uh, the shipbuilding component to it, and that company is actually looking at uh, longer term. You know, we're going to be transporting CO2 uh, across the sea. You know, it may come. You know, we it might originate in Japan, and then it's going to go to you know somewhere else to be sequestered. Uh, in the U.S., most of the CO2 is going to be moved with pipelines. By 2010, there was already um, roughly 4,000 miles of CO2 pipelines. Today, there's maybe just over 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines, and the, the pipeline safety record is, is just um, excellent. You know, and so it's, it's very safe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you'll be taking a road trip with your family, and, and you may pass over or, uh, you know, be going by many millions of tons of CO2 per day, and you never know it, right? So, sure. Um, sure. The trans yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, so, so most of it's done by pipeline. We don't really get too involved with that uh, directly um, yet. Uh, you know, we are, as we're looking at this full value chain, it, ultimately, I believe we will. Um, but right now, at least for my side of the business, we've really focused on all the way to uh, exiting, you know, a compressor, if a compressor is needed at the site. Gotcha. Gotcha. So just real quick, I saw a question come through. We were referring to a listing of global CCUS projects, um, both existing and uh, plan. Th those are not actually on either of our websites. Those are actually on a, on a third-party institution called the Global Carbon Capture uh, Institute. And you can find that. You can Google that and find it. It's a really good resource yeah. for those of you who are interested. Um, 
A uh, couple of questions on cost, which I think are, are kind of interesting and they kind of venture into the competitive uh, realm a little bit um, with regard to the technology itself. Um, the first one is if, if you were going to look at an existing power plant or an existing industrial facility versus a new industrial facility, um, all in, right? What's the cost effectiveness of deploying carbon capture at existing versus, so brownfield versus greenfield type of type of investments? Yeah, you know, it, it, I, I say this often and I wish that I didn't have to, but it really does depend on what the brownfield site looks like because, you know, the big advantage for a greenfield site is, yeah, there might be some optimizations that you have uh, with uh, cooling, for instance, uh, or, you know, uh, receiving heat for the regenerator in your carbon capture process. Um, but largely the big item that I see is on uh Space and so footprint. You know, if you're if you're going to build a greenfield facility, you can easily design where your carbon capture facility needs to be, where there aren't any construction um, obstructions, and uh, you know potentially increase the cost of building the unit. Uh, so you know construction makes up a very significant cost of the carbon capture unit, and to the extent that you can minimize that uh, by uh, reducing uh, issues at the site and uh, integrating that with the greenfield, then you're going to benefit. It's, it's difficult to give you a percentage because, that, again, uh, you know, I mentioned that it, it really just dep depends on what the brownfield site looks like, right? There are some brownfield facilities that may that might, might even be better than greenfield just because they've got more room than the particular greenfield site that you're looking at. So. Gotcha. So, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, the, the footprint definitely matters. Um, the other one, which kind of ventures into the competitive uh, realm in terms of the technology and its, and its, and its adoption um, and, and application is, is really when you think about the competitive landscape. So if I have an existing um, industrial application or existing power generation facility and I'm considering, you know, adding carbon capture to that facility versus another technology, either that could be applied at the same site <clears throat> or displace it altogether. Um, where does where does carbon capture sort of fit in the realm of, of possible outcomes? And I know that is a very, very broad question, admittedly, right? Because we could get into discussing <clears throat> carbon capture on a coal plant versus, you know, doing NGCC versus doing mm -hmm. NGC with, with carbon capture versus doing renewables and batteries. I mean, <clears throat> the world's your oyster, yeah. in other words. Right. So, uh, what, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the DOE has studied that. <laughs> IEA studied that. So there are, there are bodies out there that, that you can go and look and, and find um, decent references for great references, in fact. Um, and I largely agree with, with what their conclusions are. CCS on, um, for instance, a, a, a combined cycle um, is it, it, it looks really favorably compared to all of the many different options that you have for, for power generation. In fact, I would even say that it is better than it has been made to appear in some of those reports because you have to you have to remember that for um, like solar PV, for instance, or for wind, you know, you also have to have a cost curve, and you know the costs are continuing to decline in the in those areas still. But but for CCS, uh, I'm I'm sure that it's going to decline even faster at a greater rate, and so that has to be considered. Um, you know, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that may depend sort of on how it's deployed, and you know, when you really get to that sort of critical mass of uh, facilities where now you're getting some savings on the fabrication of the equipment, but it will happen. And so I, I think it stacks uh, really highly on the list of different options. And in fact, that's the feedback that we've seen from uh, potential partners that we're working with. Yeah, certainly the the scale opportunity is massive, right? I mean, you think about hydrocarbon applications in the energy and, and even non-energy applications, but in both of those spaces, um, you mentioned, you know, CO2 emissions that are result from a process rather than combustion. Um, just the scale of hydrocarbons in the global energy mix indicate there's a massive scale for CCS to, um, to really sort of launch into. So it'll be interesting to kind of see how that unfolds as we go forward. Um, if you could uh, maybe give a, and we could talk percentages, right? But I'm going to ask you to put your, 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 take out your crystal ball and put on your wizard hat, right? So um, if you could look forward, say 10, 15, 20, 25 years, just in those increments, 
um, given that everybody likes to talk about learning curves and, and, and cost reductions and stuff like that, best guess, what do you think we, we will see on the CCUS front with regard to reduction in, in, in the cost of the technology? So let's just pick a 10 years out from now, uh, you know, where we are today, you know, you've seen 45Q, it's around $50 per ton for sequestration, or it is $50 per ton for sequestration, considering going up to 85 and build back better. Uh, $50 per ton will work for some facilities now. Um, you know, there may be certain reasons why we're not seeing uh, many of those projects being executed yet. And I believe that they will be soon. But if that kicks off, if uh, the transition to $85 per ton happens, uh, you know, we're the cost of CTS, uh, again, it, it depends on so many different factors. But if you're just looking at capacity, and you know, you're, you're an emitter of, um, you know, two, three, 4,000 tons per day plus, then you're, you're going to fall somewhere around that $50, $60 per ton range, right? And so, $85 per ton, at least in the U.S., is going to, I think, drastically increase the deployment of CCS. So, you know, by, by 2030, you know, the projections say that we have, that we should have, right, a billion tons per year captured globally. Um, you know, we're at 40 million tons per year now. We've got, you know, 25x to get there. Or just to put that in context for you, compared to Petronova, which is, nearly 5,000 metric tons per day, that would be like 600 petronovas, right? And so you, know, you have a limited number of captured technologies that are commercial today. And yeah, it, it, it's uh, a significant load to distribute across those captured technologies. Um, but I think that we will eat a big chunk out of it, right? And so we're gonna have, you know, we will have uh, 500 million tons uh, easily by 2030. That's my impression. And, and um, getting to that 500 million tons is going to cause that, you know, 50 to $60 per ton number. I would, you know, just, uh, you know, wet thumb in the air kind of estimate, say that, it, that it's going to fall below 50 for sure, probably 40, but we'll see. You know, we're, it's a constant yeah. effort for us, and that's one of the key aspects of our design. You know, the, there's a PCC report, post-combustion capture report, the third one, which Chevron contributed to, that states that basically for every 15% um, increase in CapEx, it's roughly equivalent to like a 1% increase in OpEx. And so you really want to try to improve the OpEx too, right? Yeah. Because if these facilities are operating for 12 years plus, well, OpEx turns out to be a pretty significant number. And so uh, a lot of our work may not necessarily show up really in CapEx per se, and not, at least not quite yet, you know, it's going to show up in OPEX. And so the KS21 solvent that I mentioned um, is an improvement on our KS1 solvent, uh, primarily from the aspect of OPEX. And so we can see uh, about a 5 to 10% variable OPEX reduction by, by switching to KS21. And so, yeah, that, that's something that will inherently come down as these facilities are deployed, and, and we're continuing to work on that ourselves as well. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I, I'm glad you kind of started that off with with a recognition of the of the tax credits, right? The, of the 45Q, and even its potential escalation. Because one thing that's certainly true in any any kind of discounted cash flow model that you would want to build to assess the viability of this technology, if you reduce the opex, that 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 tax credit has a a, a profound impact um, that increases as the opex drops. So that's that's really interesting. Could really help acceleration of the technology. Um, uh, I've we have time for one more question. It's actually a short one. So, um, and I'm, I'm sure you can wax about this a little bit, but it's really about scale of capture. Um, when we think about cost and we think about all the different sources of CO2 emissions that are out there in the world, you know, they're not all large, right? Some of them are actually quite small and some of them are persistent. Um, what is the, the, the minimum size Really, and I know this. There's a cost dimension to this, obviously. So, if you want to talk about that, that's fine. But, what is the minimum scale of carbon capture you would think to apply to capture some of these small emitting sources? So, it's a great question, and there's a lot of truth to the question. There are also some some ways that you can get around uh, scale issues, and so you know, let's just ignore those to begin with. Uh, you know, 
you have fixed you have certain fixed costs that, that are associated with operating this facility that uh, you you know as you decrease the scale the reality is that you have uh, a smaller amount of co2 to distribute those costs over and so you know uh, a one dollar per ton uh, uh, opex number you know fixed opex number at five ten thousand tons per day you know may grow to you know twenty dollars per ton you know at fifty tons per day right and so there's certainly a a, a pretty distinct difference from uh, a low scale, and I said 50 tons per day, but you know it's it's somewhere. You know I could just pick a number. It's 100 small compared to 5,000, cool. 200 small compared to 10,000, right? But um, and not not really targeting a specific number there. But there are, as I mentioned, there are ways to get around that. And so one thing that we're doing is that we're looking at uh, standards. And so we're now talking and, and really focusing on how do we address the needs of those 100 ton per day emitters that uh, of which there are thousands right and and so i think that you're going to see that uh as one of the critical parts of distribution of our technology uh and deployment of these commercial facilities over the next 10 years now that's really interesting it actually um opens the door to what i'll now say is the final question so um given that there are so many relatively small point source emissions right that are some of them are mobile even, but we'll just stick to the point source that, that, that are kind of difficult to think about installing carbon capture equipment directly to. What do you think about direct air capture and is, is, is MHI involved in that space at all? You know, I'm not personally involved in it, but uh, I know that there are some folks that, that are looking at it, uh, some of my colleagues that have been looking at it. And, and yeah, you know, again, as, I, as I've said several times, you know, I refer to these expert bodies that uh, kind of try to predict the future. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, oppose their expertise here when they say that direct air capture will be necessary. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind with direct air capture, and I think that, it, it, you know, it's, it's great for uh, CCS at the source, is energy needs. And so direct air capture is an energy consumer, you know, just like every other process out there. And so if, uh, you know, society continues to demand a certain quality of life and, and we have countries that are continuing to advance and they're going to consume more energy, well, we're going to con continue to need uh, a lot of uh, power to, to address that. And, and so, you know, the thought that we might be able to, to get away from fossil fuels anytime soon, uh, I think is just, it's, uh, it's wrong, frankly. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's even just completely ignoring the fact that we have to have direct air capture, too. But if you add that on top of it, well, now we're, you know, we're to a point to where um, how do we get the energy that we need uh, to move forward? And, uh, you know, CQS is going to be a, a big part of that, um, direct, cap direct air capture. You know, 10 years from now, you may not see a, a billion tons per year of it, but, um, you know, maybe you'll see millions of tons per year, uh, but certainly will be necessary if you listen to the experts. And uh, I think it's going to drive, it will drive the need for carbon capture on uh, power generators, as I've just mentioned. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. It's um, lots of, I mean, the technology is fascinating. There's so many different point, you know, points to apply it. You need power generation, industrial processes, uh, direct air capture, so somewhere out in the middle of the Permian Basin, for example, to to, to just pull it directly out of the air. Um, at the end of the day, it, it all leads to the same outcome, right? We're, we're talking about removing uh, removing CO2. Um, so, all right, we're, we are up against it on time, actually a little bit over. Um, uh, Jared, thank you so much for, for joining us today and very in, informative conversation. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, Ken. All right. Everybody else, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, um, and we'll see you next time.